very excited to introduce our first speaker, Maggie Breslin, who's really a storyteller. And she, has, she has a lot of great reasons for being a storyteller. She's lived in uh, 10 states and moved 13 times. Right? Ooh. Wow, that's a lot of stories in there. That's a lot of, that's a lot of stories right there. And she also has her first career in film and animation and interactive, all storytelling mediums, which um, she's able to use all of that to really help uh, improve uh, the healthcare world through patient storytelling, et cetera. So I'm gonna hand off to Maggie to kick us off for the day. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. excellent. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, after the video, I feel like I probably will need to give You guys kind of already know a lot of this. Um, whoops. It's encrypted. Oh, she's <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's uh, top secret, if you can figure it out. So I can go ahead and get started. So I'm the director of a nonprofit organization called the Patient Revolution, which some of you um, may have heard of. One of my uh, collaborators, the chair of that organization, is uh, a fellow by the name of Victor Montori, um, who some of you may have, uh, have um, uh, had some interactions with in the past. And one of the places that I really wanted to start in talking about who I am and how I came to do the work of Patient Revolution is to really ground the fact or sort of start with the fact that I do not come to the work that I do um, with a background as a clinician. Um, I have spent a lot of time in um, healthcare facilities, but um, not as a, a person by the bedside. Um, I also don't come to this work through a kind of patient advocate kind of point of view. Um, and uh, instead, the kind of place that I come to it is as a background as a designer and a researcher. Um, and I started working in healthcare as a designer and researcher about 15 years ago uh, when I began working uh, in that role at the Mayo Clinic. Um, and uh, we can grab my computer too. <laughs> um, uh, about 15 years ago. And um, what was uh, that was the place where I started to kind of discover um, what my kind of interest and the opportunities I think within um, healthcare might be. And my role kind of as a researcher, what I really bring to it is my way of understanding areas or challenges or um, issues related to healthcare is really through observation and interviews. It's by going out and watching and then talking to people as a way of really kind of understanding and, and kind of grounding um, uh, that understanding in the kind of reality of human experience. Um, and then the part of the, the designer, the piece that I, I bring to it is once I've kind of developed that understanding, is to then use my design to make something as a way to respond or kind of build, um, build a possible future um, into that kind of new, new zone or kind of new space. And so that's really the kind of practice that I've brought to the patient revolution, whose kind of mission and, and goal um, is uh, an action and advocacy organization for careful and kind care. Um, and I, I can kind of get, in, get into that. We'll get into that a little bit here. So the, I tried to, I was thinking a lot about um, what does it look like uh, it, as an exercise, knowing that you all are really focused on this kind of movement to action, which is very much something that we're looking at kind of within patient revolution as well. And so I wanted to start thinking about what could we potentially do um, as an exercise together um, that would sort of speak to that idea of, um, of action. And so the thing that I kind of kept coming back to, which is something that I come back to a lot in my practice as I think about what is it, uh, what are the, the problems and the challenges that we're trying to address within patient revolution, and what's the future that we kind of imagine or that we see, um, I always kind of come back to the idea of conversation. Um, clinicians and patients together um, talking to each other. And that's, I find, is kind of like my lodestar for this type of work. And so, does that work? Um, uh, so this was just a, 
the, these are a couple of examples of, of kind of uh, the work or things that I've been involved in to give you a little bit of a sense of what that kind of research and design piece kind of looks like um, in terms of developing the understanding and then kind of thinking about what can we make in sort of response to that. And so, like I said, um, I thought for the exercise that we would go through today, we're really grounded in this idea of conversation. And I think, um, for me, one of the enormous opportunities that I've had working within healthcare as a designer and a researcher has been the opportunity to see um, hundreds of interactions, hundreds of conversations that clinicians and patients have, have kind of had with each other. And I find that they are um, so useful in helping me understand what it is that we're really trying to do with healthcare. And so what I thought we would do today is kind of use this a little bit as a grounding mechanism as we kind of go through the talk. And the reason why I think this is so important is because I believe this is true, that care happens in conversation. Um, that conversation is essentially the vessel through which um, clinicians and patients come together and they um, process uh, emotions and uh, physical issues and intellectual issues, and the way that they kind of come together and figure out, okay, what are we gonna do in response to a problem? Um, and so what I wanna do as we kind of start today is ask all of you to think for a second and identify a conversation that stands out to you in your mind. Some uh, interaction uh, with a clinician that you can remember. It could be for yourself, it could be for a family member, um, and I want you to be one that's positive, it could be one that's negative, and I want you to just spend a couple of seconds kind of keeping that in your mind. I'm going to ask you to kind of come back to it as we move through the kind of exercises of the sort of discussion here this morning, um, and to think a little bit about what did you talk about? How did you talk with each other? What are the things that you remember um, or that seem really meaningful to you from that particular interaction? Um, because those are the things that I want to you to kind of bring to the discussion that we're going to have. And so this is kind of the agenda that I put up, uh, that I, I kind of thought I would walk us through, is um, to really ground in this idea of conversation. So conversations is possibility, and then thinking about conversations and the problems of industrial healthcare, um, thinking about conversations and what it can help us understand about a movement for careful and kind patient care, and then also conversations as a place of action. And what does that potentially look like? So conversations is possible. Um, one of the very first uh, projects that I worked on um, when I started working in healthcare, so this was around 2005, about 14 years, 14, 15 years ago, um, was to uh, think about a, to develop a conversation tool that can help patients engage in the discussion and the decision making around their medications, patients with type 2 diabetes. And so I started by going out into exam rooms and observing, and what I found was that there wasn't much conversation that was happening. And most of the visits were the same. Uh, at some point, the physician would say, I think you need to be on a medication. Uh, you should probably be on metformin. Here's the prescription. And they would hand it to the patient. The patient would leave the visit with it. And it was sometime after that, after they had left that room, when a patient would make a decision about that medication. They would make a decision when they bothered to get it filled, or if they did get it filled, if they took it the way it was kind of prescribed. And they were sort of doing all of their decision making kind of in that moment. And so what we ended up doing was we created a tool um, that we call Diabetes Issues Cards. And here's a little kind of preview of them that we brought into the clinical encounter. They included a number of different medications, and the issue cards were things like cost, daily routine, uh, daily monitoring, uh, low blood sugar. Um, and the idea was that the physician would sort of, or the clinician would present these cards and ask the patient, uh, which issue would you like to discuss first? And so really the idea of the tool was it created a space uh, for patients to engage in a conversation with their clinician about their type 2 diabetes medication um, that didn't have, uh, didn't center around A1C. And we, the team that I was working with, we ran a clinical trial for this. And one of the stories that came out of the clinical trial is one that I come back to a lot. And so there was a, 
uh, a 90, uh, like a, a 92 year old man who was seeing this family physician. He, he'd been seeing this physician for a number of years. Uh, he was randomized into the trial. Um, he was, his wife had passed away a few years ago and this gentleman was right on the cusp of moving into uh, assisted living. And so he came in and he was with his physician and his physician asked, um, which, of, which of these issues would you like to start, you know, start discussing? And um, the patient said, uh, weight effects. And the, the, the physician was kind of like, uh, okay. Um, you're like 92. I don't know what we're necessarily <laughs> kind of thinking about, but he said, okay, well, so what, what about weight effects? And the patient said, well, I'm about to move into this assisted living facility, and there's all sorts of beautiful ladies there. <laughs> <laughs> and then the physician kind of laughed, and he said, okay, well, um, they looked at the, at the sheet, and one of the drugs that was uh, had some weight loss sort of associated with it was an injectable. And so the physician said, well, this one has weight loss associated with it, but it is an injectable. I don't know how you would feel about that. And he said, well, that would be fine. The nurses are the ones who give you injections in the nursing home mm -hmm. from the assisted living facility, and they're cute too. <laughs> <laughs> and the physician kind of laughed. And, the, and all of a sudden, even though it was a patient he had known for years, there was a dialogue, there was an exchange that was different. This was a number of years ago, and that medication was much newer at the time, and so it wasn't on this patient's kind of formulary. And so the physician actually had to go and do extra work, make extra phone calls, um, in order to be able to try and get this patient this medication. But he was invested. He saw that he saw that he could do something. He could care for the patient that was in front of them. And so when people ask me, what does careful and kind care look like? I often say it looks like that. And it doesn't mean we create that exact interaction for every patient, but it means that we're creating an environment and supporting those types of dialogues, those types of exchanges that then allow for care to be shaped around um, the lives of the patients. And so because this was one of my first projects that I worked on kind of within the healthcare space, what this really taught me, and I think the reason why I come back to conversations a lot, is that conversations are a place of possibility. That there is an opportunity to shift what we do um, and change the way that conversations are happening um, in healthcare. And that is something that I think is critical uh, to thinking about um, action and how do we begin to take action. So as time has passed and I've kind of moved forward and now within the patient revolution we're sort of thinking about what, what is the problem with the patient revolution and the idea of care for and kind care designed to respond to. And they're designed to respond to the problem of industrial health care. Um, and my colleague, Victor Montori, has a, a really great talk that he gives, especially from sort of a clinician point of view, around what industrial health care is and what are kind of the problems of it. But I'm going to kind of recreate a little bit of that, but again, reframed around this conversation. So now if we take the lens of industrial health care and we're back in this exam room again with, with a clinician and with a patient, and now what are we doing or thinking, how would we look at this particular interaction. Well now in this interaction, the person on the left is not a clinician, they're a provider. And they're a provider who is delivering care. And in this version, care is a product, which is, we can tell because we've had to make care a noun and introduce another verb, which we don't really have to do because care is already a verb. <laughs> but now, Care is something that these two people are producing, the product of care. And once it's been created in their exchange and in their back and forth, the institution will take that product and will turn to the payer and will say, here's what we made. Is this of high enough quality? Is this of low enough cost? And this way of looking at healthcare, of looking at conversations, has repercussions. That when we have designed the system to create a care product, then we have to we have to do things to allow that to happen. 
We have to limit the problems, the options, and the actions that are potentially available. I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this in terms of um, you'll, the, uh, the provider will only be able to address one or two of your issues today. No matter how many you have, you have to narrow them down. We all feel it in terms of limiting time and limiting resources. So I only have 10 minutes. I only can, uh, when you're talking about sort of, um, you mentioned that you're talking about social determinants of health later today. That's a real challenge, right? I don't want to bring up something I can't do anything about. So we limit the conversations that we're willing to have based on what we feel comfortable or available to, to provide. And we also limit the information and stories that we ask patients to bring into that space. So it's very often that patients feel that um, stories that, about things that may be going on in their lives, struggles that they may be having, anxiety related to divorce or related to work, things that are absolutely impacting their health, but in their mind, they don't fall under the, the umbrella of something a clinician can do something about, and therefore they don't belong in the space. So patients self-censor. And this has repercussions. So when this happens, patients become a blur. They feel unseen and kind of unheard. They cease to be a full person. We either see them too close in terms of, we see them as a number, a lab result, or a biopsy, or we see them too far away as a statistic, uh, a person like you in a relationship to a population health kind of concept. Um, and then, Clinicians also, this impacts clinicians as well, but they feel a loss. Uh, clinicians go with the number of people who stood up who were students. I'm sure if we were to pull you, kind of ask you today, the students who go into this work who want to be clinicians are pursuing a calling. Um, and when we design healthcare in an industrial way, we limit the ability to kind of uh, draw or to engage in that calling, and that is leading to an epidemic of burnout. And the other thing is somebody, uh, or in the, um, I think uh, Dave was mentioning in the video, the idea of kind of metrics, right? So what are the things that we look at to kind of understand, um, or maybe less metrics and more heuristics? Um, to me, conversation is a really interesting heuristic to look at, to understand kind of what's happening. And in industrial healthcare, conversations start to look more the same. Because that's the goal. That's how you make it into a product. So, recognizing that that's the world that we're living in now, and being concerned about the trends that may be um, embedding that even deeper into the, the world that we live in, um, the patient revolution is really designed to try and shift the, the movement and the focus away from an industrial health care and towards careful and kind patient care. So potentially, what, what would that look like? So here we are again. It's like uh, Groundhog's Day. Each day you guys wake up. Now we're back, we're back in the exam room with a, a patient and a clinician. And so now here we are within the frame of careful and kind patient care. So we think about this, in this, in this version, we have a clinician and a patient who are coming together because of a problem. The patient's experiencing a problem, and they're going to figure out what to do about it. Not limiting that, but acknowledging that the patients, the way that patients are feeling and experiencing their problems is a valid place to start. Um, and that the goal of healthcare is to figure out what can we, together, imagine that we do in response to that. That these two people, if they're coming together, um, are not answering to an outside party. They're not answering to a payer, but they're, uh, they're in service of each other. They're answering to each other. And that that's really where that focus should be. So how do we begin, so what does this look like? How does it, how does it begin to manifest? So we have unhurried conversations rather than limits on time and resources. Which isn't long conversations necessarily, but it's conversations that are designed and we are looking to bring people together for the amount of time that they need in order to address the problems and the challenges that they may be facing. 
the solutions that they're looking to identify are those which make intellectual, practical, and emotional sense. Intellectual meaning that they're grounded in evidence-based practice. Um, practical meaning that they can fit into a patient's um, life and be sustained over time. Uh, and emotional meaning that they acknowledge and attend to the emotional component of uh, treatment and illness. Um, and that we recognize that just because it would potentially be more convenient, we can't divorce those things from the experience of um, illness and care. And we allow fully into the conversation not only the patient's biology, their lab tests and uh, results of other exams and imaging studies, but also their biography. Who are they? What's going on in their lives? That we recognize that that information is just as important to be in that space um, as the numbers. And when this happens, when we're able to bring clinicians and patients together in this way, we can feel, they feel, patients begin to feel seen and heard. Clinicians feel that they're pursuing their calling, they care, they're able to kind of care for others. I would argue that this, um, this model between he, these two, uh, the story that I told you at the beginning, the 92 year old gentleman and his clinician, they felt like this. And then the conversations that you see, if you were to peek in um, and see this clinician and patient coming together, those conversations reflect individual experiences. They make good stories, right? Because they have that unique aspect which grounds them into a person's context of life. So, I'm sure many of you, um, as, as, we've, uh, kind of, as we've sort of pursued the work of the patient revolution, um, are probably thinking, yes, that's what I want. Um, careful and kind patient care. How do, we, how do we begin to make that happen? Um, and that's really kind of this idea, this kind of seeing conversations as a place for action. Um, and how do we begin to kind of move ourselves towards this future? I don't want to um, claim in any way that we have figured this out. <laughs> Um, 100%. But this is, uh, again, as our um, work as observers and as um, designers, um, as people who seek to understand and then seek to make in response to that, this is a place that we're really interested in trying to um, imagine uh, with others how do we begin to kind of build this future. And so once again, we kind of come back, conversations as place of action. So one, one way we can think about this is the, the place kind of small between the clinician and patient. So this person and uh, this patient and this clinician, um, what can they, within the constraints and space that they may have, what can they begin to do? And we've created, and some of our partners have created some tools that potentially help to do this type of work. Um, uh, even though it is really small, but recognizing that it can have huge impacts um, for uh, clinicians and patients. And so one tool that we created is a plan your conversation tool. Uh, it's generic, it's condition agnostic, it's a set of five cards, and the five cards have the starts of sentences. Um, I want to talk about, it's important to me because it might help you to know I hope I want this conversation to lead to, and I'm nervous this conversation will lead to. And we we created it initially because we were really interested in the idea of what could we do that would allow patients to practice a conversation before they have to have it with a clinician. And so this was our kind of like most low-fi version um, that people could use. Uh, they could fill out the cards. We encourage them to say it out loud to somebody else. Um, or at least say it out loud to themselves. There's enormous power in hearing yourself say something out loud. Um, and then we found that just a simple framework like this can, uh, can lead to a certain amount of sort of self-discovery that then um, can help patients make that bridge um, in, into, that, uh, into the conversation with the clinician. Um, our partners uh, at Mayo Clinic in uh, Victor's research group, the, the care unit, have created a tool called ICANN um, which is designed to uh, solicit kind of information and input uh, about a patient's life that can then become part of the conversation. And one of the most powerful innovations that, that it has done 
is that it has all of these dimensions, your family, your friends, your work, your finances, your spirituality, where you live, and it asks you, asks you to identify if that is a source of satisfaction, or a burden, or both. And the both is a place that really kind of opens it up. Because in talking with patients, you often find that this is a sentiment that they would love to be able to communicate, but they really struggle to be able to do that. There really is a very little mechanism for it. But they often are looking for ways to say, this is important to me, but it's also hard. I know you asked me to eat better, and I'm trying, but I'm not doing it perfectly. Um, and so tools that can help kind of support that type of dialogue, incredibly helpful. On the right-hand side here, you can see um, Another, this is a, a, a tool for talking about depression medications. It's similar to the one that we created for um, diabetes medications. Um, these are all, uh, you know, simple, simple little tools um, that can kind of fit into care as it exists right now, which you know really is defined by that kind of industrial agenda. I think there's a real limit to what these can do because. Um, by and large, I don't think that the problems of um, healthcare today are um, uh, bad patients or bad clinicians. They're not patients who aren't doing as much as they should or clinicians that aren't doing as much as they should. They're good clinicians and good patients caught in a system that's not very supportive of them. Um, but I think that these do show, again, that there is a place of action. There is opportunity within conversations um, to begin to introduce maybe a small bit of information that doesn't sort of, uh, that isn't present there right now. Um, then kind of we've also tried to imagine beyond that. So um, outside of this exam room, what does it begin to look like if we're trying to imagine how do we affect change in these conversations? And we're really interested in the idea of how are we supporting skills and resources and support for the practice of kind of both of these people. And of course the, um, the idea of supporting this for clinicians, I think there's a little bit more of a history here um, in terms of medical education uh, and uh, continuing medical education and communication <laughs> skills. And even though I think there's enormous opportunities to do uh, more forward thinking work in those spaces, um, but the idea is what can we be doing that helps to support how clinicians think and feel and talk with their patients. Um, and what skills and resources might enable them to begin to do that more. But the other area that I think is potentially even more interesting is how do we begin to do that for patients? Um, and we haven't necessarily in the past thought about investing in um, skills and resources and kind of support to help patients develop their communication skills so that they can be part of this, um, this kind of scenario. And so that's one place is one area where we've begun to kind of explore um, what this might look like. So we've been um, developing as kind of an extension of our, some of our shared decision making work, um, these kind of community peer events uh, around different topics. We've said that they're kind of modeled on Tupperware parties. Um, they mostly happen, uh, and because, maybe also because our initial ones have been with women, but they mostly happen in people's homes or maybe libraries um, or uh, other spaces, but not clinical spaces. Um, and the idea is that somebody hosts, this is where the Tupperware party idea kind of comes from, and we bring, um, they'll invite from their social network and bring together a group of people, and we create a space that's outside of the clinical <coughs> environment um, for people to begin to uh, think and feel and talk about what may be important to them around a topic um, so they can start to work through that before they find themselves in a doctor's office or a clinical <coughs> space having to make a decision about it. Um, and so we've been doing this around cardiovascular health for women um, and really uh, engaging. Uh, we have a cardiologist who joins us and who's partnered with us for, at Yale for this work. Um, and it's been really interesting. I, I realized after we started doing these prototypes that um, uh, there's kind of no space where people can come together and just ask a lot of questions of like a cardiologist around the kind of a frame of information that most of our medical education or patient education is framed as a lecture. 
here's information and I'm giving you this information, but it doesn't necessarily kind of inspire this type of dialogue. And so we really designed this around um, helping people kind of have information around some of the um, issues that we have evidence related to, but it's um, but it's not going to go into the kind of calculator about what their sort of, sort of health is. So it might be related to the exercise diet, their family history, stress, um, their pregnancy experiences, their uh, kind of menopause experiences, and it's a really interesting space to have people be able to ask questions and people to be able to kind of learn. Um, we haven't been able to tie it to the conversations yet, but I'm really interested in understanding for the women who may engage in this, when they do then go and talk to their clinician about cardiovascular health, do they, do they feel more confident? Do they have the ability to draw from information about their um, biography that may be relevant and important? Um, you know, have we helped develop that skill set? We've also done a similar one around mammography screening. Um, so bringing women together and helping them kind of understand uh, what the, the kind of evidence looks like there. And again, to kind of create a space for them to start to think through before they have to make a decision about what may be important to them. And then, of course, the last one, the sort of big one, um, is uh, all the things that are outside that are pushing on this encounter. Um, and that's the place really where we're most interested in trying to move towards and thinking about how do we uh, affect uh, action in terms of system redesign and policy um, that will change the nature uh, that is necessary ultimately um, to get to the kind of careful and kind of care that we're kind of interested in. Um, and when we think about the sort of systems redesign and policy piece, we're thinking about staffing and workflow decision making and communication and reward systems and policies. And how are all of those things uh, impacting the way that kind of clinicians and patients are able to kind of come together. And so as, as part of this work, we've been doing a larger kind of project engaging with um, uh, a whole primary care clinic. Um, and the care teams and the sort of scheduling teams associated um, with, uh, with those areas uh, to uh, recenter um, their systems design on um, care and the idea of longitudinal healing relationships. And what does that look like? A co-design effort, because again, we think that um, one of the things with that project that we began to sort of notice was that um, the how many times in healthcare now the um, when patients reach out the answer is no. I'm sorry, we don't have any appointments available for you. Um, no, we can't see you for that on this particular day. And how demoralizing that is both to patients and to staff. Um, and so we're working. That's an opera, that's an example of kind of working within. Um, within the system to understand can we kind of engage with that type of culture change. Um, we also, if any, any of you who might know um, uh, Victor or have heard Victor speak, uh, Victor is a real like burn it to the ground, build to the ground guy. So, <laughs> so we've also kind of been exploring that that space as well. Um, and we're looking to, uh, we're, we're putting into place the idea of a, um, a care fellowship that will actually invite people to begin to work with us to address this level of um, the challenge in particular, to bring expertise around these different areas to help us think beyond um, the kind of way that the systems work right now and imagine what that might look like in the future. Uh, and so as we kind of um, close, uh, I'll sort of bring you back to this idea of the conversation. Um, and the idea about what it means and what we want out of a kind of healthcare, um, out of a, a healthcare system. Um, and that really it is about creating these kind of spaces where people can begin to kind of come together. And as you think about the, um, the story that you, uh, or the memory that you were sort of reflecting on in the beginning, um, one thing I'll, I'll potentially uh, ask you all to do, if you're kind of interested, uh, is we created, a, as part of our work, is we tried to understand 
what are the things that um, make it hard for clinicians and patients to be able to come together? And we created a set of barrier columns. So we have these eight barriers for patients, and then I'll click, we also have eight barriers for um, clinicians. Um, and these are things that, that kind of make it um, challenging to be able to kind of engage and kind of connect with each other. And I think each one of these represents an opportunity um, for programs and interventions and tools that help clinicians and patients be able to kind of overcome these. And I'll give you a sense, this is the kind of uh, clinician one as well. And so I'll invite you to, oftentimes when we do this exercise, I ask people to do just what I did with you all in the beginning, think about a, 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 a visit that stands out, a conversation that stands out in your mind, and then select the cards that are relevant to that particular visit. And then I ask them to tell me the story, why did they pick those cards, to tell me the story of why did they pick those cards. And because the work that we're doing, I think, is so kind of centered on this idea of um, awareness and beginning to kind of understand the importance um, and what's happening in those conversations that kind of seem um, rote. And I, I think one of the things for me uh, is so challenging is that, like, your conversations with your doctor are both banal, but, um, you know, you probably have had many of them and haven't necessarily paid a lot of attention to them, but they're also kind of like a black box. You know your own, but you don't necessarily know anyone else's. And so I think opening up that space is a real opportunity for people to see conversations as that kind of place of action. And so I invite you, if you feel comfortable, on our website, there's an opportunity to tell us your stories, which we're trying to collect and add into our story library. Um, and so if you feel moved, uh, you can certainly take these barrier cards and then um, engage, uh, go to the website and um, be able to and tell us your story and which ones of these kind of stood out to you um, and why and how is it making, how is it having you reflect on your uh, conversation with your clinician or your conversation with your patient if you are a clinician. Um, and with that, uh, I'll sort of bring it to a close. This is my information, uh, patientrevolution.org, our website and also our Twitter. Um, I'm kind of a social media uh, dummy, but um, uh, but you know, please uh, please feel free to tweet us. We'd love to sort of stay uh, in contact. Um, our chair, Victor Montori, wrote a book called Why We Revolt, which lays out the manifesto of um, the Patient Revolution in a series of essays. Uh, and so, if you've been excited about this, you can certainly um, sort of uh, follow along and read there uh, and sign up for our newsletter to hear about.